All right, the riskiest part of the day for me, I'm taking my hat off with no hair. Hey, welcome everybody. My name's Chuck Bonham. I'm the director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. My assignment is to tell you why we are here today. Thanks for joining us. So the last of the 48 contiguous states was created in 1910, Arizona. In 1912, the Titanic hit the iceberg. This is, by the way, exactly where I expected the speech to go. <laughs> yeah, keep going. In 1914, we completed the Panama Canal. So the 1910s were also an era of innovation. I kid you not. We had the first modern zipper. Okay. We had a pop-up bread toaster come on the market. And in 1913, the New York World published the first crossword puzzle. Right. We've benefited from those innovations forever. They've evolved to adapt to society's needs. Right behind me is a dam that has not evolved over that same time scale. Daguerre Point Dam behind me was built in 1910. It needs to evolve and adapt to the 21st century. Even in the best of times, it's a very difficult barrier for salmon and steelhead migrating upstream. And it's a complete barrier to sturgeon and lamprey. Above here is 12 miles of good habitat they can't access regularly. Every mile of salmon habitat matters in California right now. We're here today because the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the National Marine Fisheries Service, the Yuba Water Agency are executing a term sheet. That term sheet is a commitment to a restoration program and plan for this Yuba River. It has three things. We're going to fix Daguerre Point Dam by building a natural fishway that resembles the original footprint of the Yuba River pre-gold mining around that side of the dam. So all these fish species can swim upstream and downstream as they wish of their own volition. We're also going to screen the water infrastructure on the other side of the river, which is essential for the local economy and water supply reliability. We're going to put fish screens on those diversions that meet the 2023 criteria of the federal and state agencies. And lastly, if you could imagine, look way up in the distance, that's the Sierra. It's full of snow, thank God. That's the original home of Yuba River salmon. We're going to implement a pilot project based on science that as soon as 2025, we will be taking spring run Chinook back up a above New Bullard's Bar Dam on the North Fork of the Yuba River for the first time in over 100 years. It's time. We need to do this right now. The salmon need it. Think about sturgeon. They're super large and like me, they can't jump. They can't get over this barrier. Think about Pacific lamprey for crying out loud. They'll scare you to death. They're this toothless, ageless, ancient super class of fish. They go back 450 million years. They're one of the oldest lineages on the planet. Fixing infrastructure, modernizing our prior commitments is really good for the environment. California has never remained still. It's always moving. We can do this. We need to do more of it. And with that, let me turn it over to Willie Whittlesey, who's the general manager of Yuba Water Agency and a super dear friend and great partner. Well, thanks, Chuck, and uh, Governor, thanks for coming out to uh, the little Yuba County here. We're so excited to have you, and we're excited about these projects. I don't get to stand in front of folks like this very often, and I know you'd like to get through stuff quickly, but I'm going to take a few minutes if you don't mind. Um, for everyone else, I'm Willie Whittlesey. I'm the general manager of Yuba Water Agency, and Yuba Water Agency owns New Bullard's Bar Dam on the North Yuba River. It is about 30 miles upstream from here, and it was put in, into operation in 1970. It was created in response to the 1955 floods, and it was created to reduce flood risk and provide water supply for the people of Yuba County. We also provide a significant supply of hydroelectric generation to help support the state's power grid. We reinvest our energy revenue into projects that are a benefit for the people and environment of Yuba County. Now to the good stuff. We're so excited to have the governor here today, but we're not just announcing this project. As I've worked with both our state and federal partners, I think we're redefining the way we work together. 
Yuba Water Agency is not sitting back waiting for the regulatory process to define the work we do. We're engaging with resource agency leadership, looking at each other in the eye and asking ourselves, what can we do? What should we do? These discussions are resulting in a new brand of leadership, a new way of thinking and a new way of working together to provide benefits throughout the state in many resource areas. From water supply to energy, flood control, and helping to restore conditions for fish species. And in this watershed, it's really mitigating the impacts from the gold rush era mining, where within a few decades, gold rush mining created impacts that have lasted over 150 years. We're finally taking action to reverse those impacts. Yuba Water Agency's Board of Directors thinks differently. They have a commitment to collaboration and environmental stewardship that runs deep. We've been a key partner in game-changing agreements like the Lower Yuba River Accord, which is specifically designed to provide water for salmon and steelhead while also ensuring a water supply for our local farmers and others throughout the state. We're an active partner in the North Yuba Forest Partnership, an unprecedented effort to restore our headwaters forests. We're a partner in the Hallwood Side Channel and Flood Floodplain Restoration Project, that's fish habitat and reduce flood risk. And we're honored to be standing here today as a major player in this effort. We're announcing one of the most important enhancement projects ever proposed in the Central Valley. The Fishway at DeGear Point will be an unprecedented action to restore habitat and contribute to the recovery of threatened species. By providing unobstructed passage to habit habitat that has been incredibly challenging for them to access. It also represents the first action that removes a complete barrier limiting the geographic range of the green sturgeon. This will decrease extinction risk and contribute to green sturgeon recovery. This agreement also promotes the reintroduction of spring run Chinook salmon in the upper watershed, as Chuck explained. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to implement a truly significant, comprehensive environmental stewardship pro project, and these benefits will be realized for decades. This agreement will ensure that we can continue to advance our core mission, reducing flood risk and protecting lives in the region, while also sustaining our water supply for our agricultural industry, which is the heartbeat of Yuba County. And we fully expect this project will make this river that we all love and cherish a more vibrant, healthy place for everyone and every species that lives in it. Governor, thank you for being here, for the vision and leadership that makes this partnership possible, and for joining us to celebrate this agreement I got to thank my friends and partners at CDFW, specifically um, Wade and Chuck, and also Kevin Thomas. Kevin, you're instrumental in this. Where are you at? There he is. And Kathy, the three of us have been sitting together for six months negotiating this deal, and there's times when I, I don't know where we're going, but here we are today, so thank you for that. I also have to thank the Yuba Water Agency Board of Directors for their leadership and willingness to think big. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge the U U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They're here today. Tykert and Yuba Water Agency's member unit irrigation districts for their engagement so far. They're important, important parties to help ensure the sec success of this project. Thank you very much. All right, good morning. I'm Kathy Marsinkevich. I am the Assistant Regional Administrator for NOAA Fisheries, California Central Valley Office. Thanks for being here today. Um, the, Yuba, the Yuba watershed is remarkable. And we're here today to memorialize a remarkable approach to doing something really um, pivotal and game-changing here. It's forward-looking, it's innovative, it's novel. And, you know, I appreciate Yuba Water Agency and the department for being bold with me on this. Um, I appreciate them spending time with me to be vulnerable, um, build trust, and really put our heads together to seize a moment and to put our hooks into an opportunity that is right now with a lot of different things coalescing that allows us to be here today to do something that will really allow this watershed to reach its full potential. The fishway that Chuck talked about uh, that would be constructed behind us would open up, as he said, up to 12 miles of habitat upstream of this dam for sturgeon, steelhead, and, and spring wrench and salmon. Um, 10 miles or 12 miles may not seem like a lot, but in the Central Valley, that is a win. That is a big win for these species that, you know, are kind of literally butting their noses up against the dam. 
Um, sturgeon in particular love the deep pool that's right at the face of this dam right here. These are creatures that can be 80 years old and eight feet long. They look like dinosaurs. And they're here. They're right behind you, you know, and they want to find more deep pools in that 12 miles up there. I mean, that's great for them. That's what we need for the species. The reintroduction component, moving spring wrench nook salmon above this dam and other dams up into those higher elevation parts of the watershed where there is reliable, abundant, cold water coming from the snow melt, coming from the springs. We're all a little toasty here, I know it, um, but you know, imagine being a salmon who likes to be in water that's 50 degrees. This is not where they want to be on the valley floor. There are only so many places in the Central Valley where we can put salmon in where they used to be, but maybe more importantly, where they will be and still have resilience in the face of climate change. We can't do it everywhere in the valley. We can't. And I'm not looking to if anyone's worried. But there are a handful of places that, that, that have opportunities. And the Yuba watershed, the upper Yuba, is arguably the best opportunity to get a viable self-sustaining spring-run Chinook salmon population. And that is critical, not just to the recovery of the species, but at this point, probably to its survival. So this is really a game changer. Um, it's a remarkable game changer. I'm so proud to be here today. I appreciate the efforts of Yuba Water Agency and the Department of Fish and Wildlife in getting us here and providing the resources and look forward to getting fish in those rivers in a couple of years and showing that it can happen. It can be done. Thank you. Perfect. You got yourself? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, Kathy. My name is Wade Crof and I lead our California Natural Resources Agency. And if you're here today and you had anything to do with this project, thank you very much. Salmon are a keystone species, which, which means they are an animal that defines an ecosystem. And in this case, we're talking about this incredible system of rivers in Northern California. The Sacramento River system and its tributaries, including the Yuba, the San Joaquin River system and its tributaries, the, the Klamath, the, Nor the Smith, the North Coast streams that, that flow directly into the coast. And if salmon are healthy, it means our rivers are healthy. And when salmon suffer, it's an indication that our rivers are suffering. And salmon have been impacted by 150 years of infrastructure, like the piece of infrastructure we stand in front of today. 1,500 dams, reservoirs across the state allowed for California to grow, but also disconnected salmon from 90% of its historical habitat. Uh, the growth of our state into, a, into the, almost the fourth largest economy in the world in a state of 40 million people means more of that water from our rivers gets used for our cities and towns and our agriculture. And salmon has been impacted. Climate change exacerbates that. Hotter temperatures, like what we're experiencing today, mean hotter river conditions, which is a real problem for salmon who thrive in cold water. Uh, climate change is also driving longer and more punishing droughts, including the driest three-year period we've experienced as a state, which we just ended in October. So for both the sort of the historic legacy of development and climate change, our salmon need help. We need to implement an all of the above strategy to help our salmon recover, help our aquatic ecosystems recover and thrive. And that's what we're doing. It includes allowing salmon to get around barriers like that which we stand in front of today. Uh, that is, uh, embodied by this project, but also, of course, the, the removal of four dams along the Klamath River, the largest river restoration project in American history that California Native American tribes and this governor have championed. It also includes the re removal of Matillaha Dam in Ventura County, Ringe Dam in Los Angeles County, and countless other barriers. Where we can't remove a barrier, thanks to fish and wildlife and nymphs and so many others, we're now looking at moving salmon above those barriers to spawn in that historic habitat and then help them back to the ocean. So removing barriers. It includes restoring, expanding habitat for our salmon to spawn and rear in. You know, California has these historic floodplains that have benefited salmon over time. In big wet winters like this, historically, salmon would go out on that floodplain feed, hide from predators, and then get nice and healthy and fat to, uh, to continue their journey to the ocean. We have less floodplains than we have in the past, so we need to restore those floodplains. We also need to improve or increase water flows through our rivers, uh, both our creeks uh, in, the, in the Sierra Nevada and our main stem 
of the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. And I'm thankful for the partnership of Yuba Water Agency and other water agencies that are working constructively with our administration and our state water board to restore flows into our rivers. Fourth, we also need to uh, strengthen our salmon strongholds, understand how climate change is evolving and where salmon have the best chance of continuing to thrive. And that's getting fish in those cold mountain streams. It includes restoring our, our conditions on those coastal streams. So salmon strongholds is another key piece. Fifth is, of course, modernizing our hatcheries. Hatcheries are really important for our commercial fisheries and our recreational fisheries and provide stability to our salmon populations. Sixth is modernizing our technology and our monitoring. We have some of the best technology and some of the most sophisticated understanding of this set of species in the world, and we need to continue to use technology to understand how we help these species recover. And then seventh, certainly not last but not least, we need partnerships. I am so thankful to Chuck Bonham's leadership and the leadership of so many, certainly led by the governor, where we are reestablishing partnerships with California Native American tribes that have stewarded salmon since time immemorial. These are a critically important species to these tribes, not only to their sustenance, but to their cultural and personal identity. And now, after 170 years of disconnection, we are restoring partnerships and allowing, enabling, empowering tribes to lead the way uh, restoring our salmon. But the partnership also extends to conservation groups like the Nature Conservancy and the Audubon Society and California Trout, Trout Unlimited. So many conservation groups that are rolling up sleeves with water agencies and with agricultural providers to be solutions focused. Historically, there's been a lot of finger pointing in California water policy, whether it's urban versus rural communities, north versus south, fish versus farms. This project represents an important departure. It represents one point of progress in an all-of-the-above approach where we're bringing people together to restore salmon and, in the process, restore our rivers. I am so thankful to work for somebody who is driving us to do better every day, to move further and faster toward this end, and that is Governor Gavin Newsom. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Your dermatologists would appreciate that. Uh, I, frustratingly, I got nothing left to say that hasn't been said. And, when I say nothing, I mean, I was going through, like, item four, five, he got to seven, uh, even got hatcheries in there. I could just add we put $84 million into investing in hatcheries, by the way. I'm proud of that. Uh, but I'm more importantly proud of, uh, well, I guess my observation, um, the passion and pride that is uh, reflected in the four speakers you just heard from, uh, passion and pride but also passion and action, actually moving the ball forward, actually manifesting something I know you've been talking about for decades. Uh, and I'm just grateful to their leadership, their stewardship. Kathy, thank you for all your good work. Uh, uh, Willie, uh, everybody was singing Willie's praises as we we're walking over the dam saying this would not have happened without Willie. So Willie, thank you for making it happen. Supervisor, thank you for taking the time to be here. Uh, Chuck, uh, there's not a Zoom call or meeting on any topic where he doesn't bring this up. Uh, it has nothing to do with anything else we're talking about, but he keeps bringing it up because he wanted to bring me up uh, and be here today. And so, Chuck, thank you for your extraordinary work. And Wade was right to highlight a lot of that in the context of the seven bullet points you made, but particularly the work we did together up at the Klamath and those four dams. Uh, that's a big deal, 300 miles uh, of restoration. And it's just part and parcel of a narrative that we wanted to share with you today. And I think if there's anything I want to offer briefly, it's just to contextualize this. This is one of many projects this state uh, has been working on and is advancing. This is a big commitment, $60 million project. We hope to get it done in the next few years. Permitting uh, will be uh, our uh, principal challenge, but that's also man-made, and so it can be uh, addressed uh, through new actions and a new intentionality and determination to get this project actually complete. $60 million project, $30 million coming from the state, $30 million from Yuba Water Agency, working with our federal partners as well. But this is one of many different projects. I was just going through a list the other day. I think we have 
number of buckets. We put $100 million up for salmon restoration. This is $30 million from that bucket. Uh, I mentioned the hatcheries, the $84 million. Uh, we did some remarkable things. I remember at the McLeod earlier this year as it relates to some salmon restoration, uh, which was novel, uh, but also part and parcel of a broader effort. We put $200 million aside in the budget a, a year or so ago on watershed and uh, strategies around replenishment as well as issues around resiliency. Uh, I think there's 30 projects that are underway or have been completed. Just shy of $60 million has been invested in that space. I guess I'm emphasizing a point. We're moving. There's real progress. And there's progress in an area that, frankly, gets under-resourced, not just fundamentally in the context of the financial contributions, but I think in mind share. And I just will close on this. You know, I don't know if you saw last night, today, there's some news around the impacts of fossil fuels on our greenhouse gases, the impact that's had in the western United States. Uh, impacts it's had up in Canada as it relates to the cause and effect, uh, an attribution study as it relates to the cause and effect of 88 fossil fuel companies and the impact that's had on wildfires here in the state of California. They estimate 40 percent of the impacts on those wildfires have been directly connected in the last 40 years to those emissions. Uh, that attribution science is taking shape in the climate context, as Wade was referencing. You may have seen uh, the news around the debt ceiling. I think it's interesting that there's not been a lot of focus on why is the debt ceiling debate happening June 1st. The reason you know well, but I don't think is broadly shared by the American public, is they had to move up the date because they're not collecting enough cash. Why are they not collecting cash? Because the IRS delayed tax payments. California, we estimate $42 million were delayed between now and October. Why does that matter? Well, the feds can't pay their bills. But it wasn't just California, it was other states. Why were taxes delayed in Florida, not just California, in a half dozen or dozen other states? It's because of unprecedented impacts associated with climate. The deluge out here, the extreme events out there. All these things are connected. What damn more evidence do we need about the world we're living in? This is not just isolated to a few small issues. This has a global construct in terms of manifesting uh, in the stress and anxiety uh, that we are now experiencing around this debt ceiling debate in Washington, D.C. That is an important dot to connect in the context of this debate. But the dot that I will close with that we don't connect often enough, which I alluded to, is the issue of biodiversity, the issue of habitat, the issue of land and water. So often it's a greenhouse gas conversation. So often it's a conversation about tailpipe emissions. So often it's about an abstract. Uh, not enough about you know, giant sequoias or, or coastal redwoods or the California condor uh, or sturgeon and salmon, the things that bring us here today and unite us all, regardless of our politics, urban, rural, regardless of who we're jumping up and down for in 2024 in the last election, lifestyle, places, traditions that sort of mark this moment and this project that are universal, that connect us together. And I, I don't take this for granted that this is going to be around 20, 50, 100 years from now for my kids and grandkids. I don't. I don't any longer. I may have when I was growing up, but I don't any longer. I've seen the destruction. I've seen towns wiped off the map in real time. I've seen, you know, summer vacations that didn't take shape because there's no place to go. People have gone generationally, been wiped out. And so this is important, and that's why it's been an imperative of the team to make sure we put real money in the budget for these kind of projects. And we were stubborn. Despite a modest deficit, we're holding the line on these projects, and we're moving them forward. And final, final words, they're tangible, too. So much of the work we do, you know, cause and effect, you don't see that effect for some time. These are tangible. You can see the fruits of your tax dollars. So as a taxpayer, I like, I like things like this. You know, before and after, as long as we deliver on time and on budget and hold ourselves to a higher level of accountability. So we are accountable to the world we're living in. We're accountable to this moment and we're accountable to generations that are going to ask us, what the hell did we do in this moment to make their life more gentle and to make their life more inclusive? 36 biodiversity hotspots on planet Earth. One of them we share with 40 million Americans that happen to live here in the great state of California. We cannot take that for granted. Land water, these watersheds, these precious natural resources. Thank you 
to all of the incredible work that has inspired this project. And I look forward to working with you to get those permits uh, behind us and getting this project underway. With that, we're here to answer any questions. Hi, this is Adam Beam from the Associated Press. Uh, Governor, you mentioned some of, a lot of the other projects going on throughout the state, including the uh, Klamath Dam removal. I'm um, just curious, why? what's the thinking behind doing it this way instead of just removing the dam? Are there barriers or problems Oh, my with gosh. I have, I have people chomping at the bit to answer that question. Yeah, okay. Willie, why aren't we removing this damn dam? Come on up, Willie. <laughs> All that sentiment you'll have to deal with. Adam, it is time to deal with this damn dam. And there's been a long-running, half a century or more fight over who has responsibility, what should be done, countless feasibility studies. We're at a moment in time with a budget because of the governor's leadership and the legislature's support. We can actually just bypass all that fighting and build something that's pragmatic, low cost, low operation and maintenance exposure and get it done in the next couple of years. So we can either keep these fights alive, which California is infamous for on water, or we can sit down and actually do something. I'm in the camp of doing something because I'm getting too old to do otherwise. Willie? Yeah, I'm also in the camp of doing something, and Chuck is absolutely right. Uh, we have a solution that satisfies the need, and that's volitional passage of the species at this dam. This dam was constructed to hold back mining debris and sediment, and it's doing that to this day. Yuba County was at uh, risk of flooding in the 1880s and early 1900s until this dam was created. We still have a risk of flooding, but it's now managed with New Bullard's Bar and our um, operational protocols. This dam will maintain that. It maintains the horizontal and vertical alignment of the Yuba River, and it's in Yuba County, the people of Yuba County have an interest in maintaining that. It's also used for diverting agricultural diversions for our economic engine, engine in Yuba County. But the bottom line is, is this, the solution that we're here to celebrate today provides the need for the species. And we've worked together collectively to make that happen and provide what the species need. So, Chuck, team, thank you. Adam, let me, let me say one more thing. Under President Clinton, he had a Secretary of the Interior, Bruce Babbitt, Mr. Babbitt used to say, we have about 65 to 75,000 dams in America that are taller than this high. Hmm. He also would say, that's, we've built one a day since the Declaration of Independence. Hmm. Not all dams should be removed. Most of our infrastructure is essential and it still serves a useful purpose. So you get creative, you innovate, and you incorporate the interest and you end up with a solution that we're proposing here. Hi, I'm Camille Von Canel from Politico. Governor, you've mentioned looking at water rights as part of your water strategy. Lawmakers are currently moving forward some bills increasing the authority of the State Water Resources Control Board to investigate water claims um, and fine violators. Do you support those bills in that approach? No, I, I, we had 20, over 2,600 bills are introduced. Uh, uh, folks are well versed on my unwillingness to engage in individual bills at this stage of the process. So I haven't had a chance to review those in detail, but uh, we're certainly well aware of the long overdue need to address those issues and the complexity around it. And I don't have to go further than just the Sigma process, which was difficult enough to establish and the rulemaking that we're advancing and the work we're doing, accountability still in that space to uh, underscore the nature of these fights as it relates to water rights. And of course, I'm not uh, naive about the fact we're having those exact same debates as relates to Colorado uh, in relationship to our senior water rights in California vis-a-vis -vis those other states. So I don't have an opinion on those bills just yet. Uh, well, I have another question about bills, so I'm just going to try you. Um, <laughs> you recently said in a statement that enacting sweeping law enforcement and justice reforms are a critical part of the reparations discussion. Do you support the bills in the legislature that would ban traffic stops for minor vi violations and the use of police canines during yeah, arrests? I'll, I'll, uh, I appreciate it. We're not, I'm, I'm not this moment in that position to, to comment about those bills. They haven't made my desk. One thing you learn in this business after doing it a long time, Mayor, governor uh, what appears to be the case and finally when it gets to your desk after amendments and changes uh, can radically be different so uh, there's a process that will unfold over the next few months we'll take a look uh, at what lands on my desk hi governor ashley zavala with kcra3 you mentioned permitting and i'm just curious i know you uh, on friday teased a little bit that you'd be rolling out an announcement is there any other little nugget you can give us there. Yeah, uh, 
the, and I'll tease it out further. Uh, it's forthcoming. Uh, the timeline uh, has changed, uh, maybe even changed a moment ago. I said, I'll see you. And I told him exactly when. He said, ah, well, hold on. We may change the date. So uh, very shortly. But look, I, I, I want to just make this point. The world we invented is, is, uh, is competing against us. Uh, I'm very prideful. I, I'll take a backseat to no one in terms of my passion for environmental stewardship. But I, I remember being mayor of San Francisco uh, when we were trying to get a bike lane expansion and we were sued under CEQA. So you're sued under environmental rules not to advance an environmental principle. I was involved in a private business where I was being sued because of my position on same-sex marriage. I don't know that that was the intention of CEQA when it was designed to you know, address one's issues or values as relates to uh, marriage equality. Uh, but that was pointed out. The abuse in the process is legendary, and the time uh, to getting projects delivered is profoundly existential as it relates to our low-carbon green growth future. And if we're going to transition, if we're going to meet our audacious nation-leading nation climate goals, we can't do it with the existing rules and regulations that were created for a world that no longer exists. And, you know, with respect to this project, we were joking, I won't lay Willie out, but he was like, he was like oh, here's, here's the timeline. And, and I almost took his head off. And Willie's like, hey, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just here telling you what this looks like. And I said, well, I got to be held to account being governor to, to move this project forward. It's, I mean, it's, it's about protecting, preserving a species for generations. And it's an environmental project. Environmental rules and regulations are getting in the way of, of getting under construction. The costs then are impacted and your frustration increases as taxpayers. And you go, what the hell's going on? Why am I wasting all this money? Um, uh, on these guys and, you know, throw the bums out. So I, I don't mean to belabor the point except to say I'm glad permitting's top of mind nationally and it's going to be top of mind here uh, in this state as it has been around housing in the last few years, but now more broadly uh, around these larger projects. And in the context of this project with those permits, if you could just give us a sense of right now, under current California law, CEQA, what, what it would take to get this up? Well, I'm going to have Willie answer that question. <laughs> Or Chuck, oh Chuck, yeah, Willie wants deniability. There Chuck, will. yeah. So, uh, I have the strong sense this will be my assignment going forward, <laughs> and let me tell you that we've already made a difference. So, in the fiscal year of twenty-one to twenty-two, because of Secretary Crowfoot and the governor's leadership and admonition, and I agree with the admonition, we have a world today that's not climate change; it's climate disruption. If you look at what we need to do on renewable energy, infrastructure modernization, housing, let alone everything else, we're not keeping pace, and we have to. The public expects more. So in that year, 2021 to 2022, Secretary launched something called Cutting Green Tape. In that calendar year, our department was able to accelerate permitting, shrink approvals to 70 days or less, save applicants doing restoration almost $2 million, restore 103 miles of rivers around the state, and restore about 500,000 acres of habitat because we dedicated a team to get it done promptly. That's the mentality we'll bring to this project. We have to. There's no more time. Yeah. Thanks. And it doesn't mean you're not inclusive. It doesn't mean we're not bringing all the voices uh, to the table and all the concerns. It doesn't mean you're rolling over people. It's just uh, addressing this one thing that is relentless. It's called time. Mr. Governor, good morning. Good morning to the team. Uh, question just for the us non-water folks here, including the viewers here. Uh, when, when we're talking about the project here, what's it physically literally going to look like? And, and well, Where where'd you guys bring those? Uh, we oh, actually have wondering? a great photo for you. Oh, perfect. So we're going to answer it by giving you a copy of uh, the photo. Good. Yeah. I'm looking forward well, you to could go over there and look <laughs> at it. You can answer your own question. Uh, we brought a photo, but uh, I was Thank wondering why wait. they're over there and not behind oh, us. I see. Uh, but it's the right question. We'll wait till. Thank you. Here they come. <laughs> look at that. I need to go get some video of this. Finally seeing Crowfoot go to work. <laughs> no, I mean, this is impressive. He's usually in a suit and tie yeah. on the eighth <laughs> floor of a building. Oh, nice. excellent. Okay. There you go. Well, I haven't seen what, which one's this. So do you want to explain the bowl? Yeah, yeah, yeah explain it. Willie will explain it. On the mic. Oh, Willie, do it on the mic. So you, do you want to start? You, uh, yep. start, you just... <laughs> just... 
Okay, for many years we've been trying to improve salmon habitat here. There's fish ladders on the north and south, um, but they're 1950s version fish ladders for salmon and steelhead. The, uh, the green sturgeon was listed a few years ago as threatened, and the, the green sturgeon doesn't jump, and, and Chuck mentioned lampreys don't jump either. So we, we realized we, to improve the conditions of this dam, we needed to build something that mimics a, nat a natural channel. The original Yuba River ran to the south of Deguer Point. Deguer Point is right behind me. Deguer uh, Dam was actually carved into the natural topography. So we've designed the channel that you see in, in these renderings. It's about 3,100 feet long, about a half a percent slope in slope. So all of the species we've mentioned can traverse it and, and make their way to the upper lower Yuba River. I know that sounds weird, but the upper lower Yuba River and access that spawning and rearing ground upstream of here. And that's, that's the basics here. We're at a conceptual design. We're not at 30% or 60% or 100% design. We've just proved the concept. I've had engineers look at the hydrology of the Yuba River and can we actually construct this based on the topography? Yes, we can do that. Now we will engage with other partners. We'll continue to engage with NIMFS and CDFW and others, including the tribes, to, to get this thing to 100% design and like the governor said, get through our regulatory process and start building this thing. Thank you so much. I appreciate you bringing the renderings there. Uh, one more question, just in the sense of the average viewer watching this from somewhere in San Diego or Bakersfield. I know you mentioned Matilla Hadam, you know, other issues taking place in Ventura County elsewhere. Uh, in the sense of uh, the, why this matters to them, I know maybe this is an issue here, but how will this impact the average Californian? Well, one, I would say we all have an interest in preserving this incredible environment. It, it forms our identi identity as Californians. But also, if you're somebody who uses water, which by definition every Californian does, then you care about helping restore the most threatened species, the most endangered species. We have very strong federal laws and a state law to protect species on the brink of extinction called the Endangered Species Act. It's essentially like emergency room medicine. You're going to keep the patient alive at all costs. When uh, a species slips into endangered status, that creates all sorts of uncertainty and challenges to water providers, be they water agencies for a community. Uh, and so a lot of the certainty in terms of providing water to cities in Southern California, throughout California, depends on being able to keep our, our environment healthy, keep these species more healthy so they don't slip in to that very imperiled condition on the brink of extinction. So bringing back salmon, restoring the health of our rivers is not only beneficial for the environment and those who care about the environment, it's beneficial for our water security over coming decades. If I could take one liberty and then I'll stay off the stage. I have a different reason and you may share that reason too. The secretary is absolutely right. Our future depends on reliability and being able to plan around reliability and saving salmon helps on that front. But this world is buzzing with beauty. You can still see in a child's eye the wonder when they experience nature. And we want a future that salmon are in our mighty rivers for that child. And if you know a child, I would say to any person in California, that is also a compelling reason to do more projects like this. Nice. All right. Bottom for governor 20 whatever. Uh, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Uh, anyone else? We're we done? Uh, again, just gratitude. Thank you all uh, for all your hard work and partnership and uh, stewardship. Thanks for getting us to this critical point. And uh, now the uh, hard work uh, still ahead, but, uh, but now the manifestation of all of your uh, long uh, desired and overdue uh, efforts. And so thank you all for being on here today. Take care, everybody. Hey, Governor, real quick. Will it? I'm sorry, the, the governor thinks that he runs the show here, but yeah. and I know you turned the mic off on me, but uh, we're hosting you in Yuba County, and I don't know that we're ever going to get you back because yeah, you're so busy and doing all the other things you do, but thank you for being here. I appreciate it, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. All right.